High quality and comfortable public transport is an essential part of a modern livable city. You can build the most beautiful buildings and surround them with the best parks, but without the ability to move quickly, comfortably and safely from point A to point B, there will be not much joy with it. So today we will talk about why we need public transport. But first let's dive into a little historical background for a better understanding of how public transportation appeared. Already in ancient times, people realized that if they lived together, it would be much easier to solve security issues and exchange goods, services and knowledge. This is how the first cities appeared, which were compact and grew as long as the surrounding agricultural land could feed their inhabitants. And that's why all the cities were compact and walkable. Delivering food from far away was problematic, because you can't bring a lot with horse-drawn carriages. That's why cities arose in the most fertile areas, at the intersection of trade routes and near rivers and seas. This pattern remained until the Industrial Revolution of 18th and 19th century and the introduction of the railway, which made it possible to quickly transport huge amount of goods over a very long distances. This led to the unseen urban expansion, including places where it couldn't have appeared before. In the 19th century, cities grew large enough to make walking problematic and new big factories became places where masses of people needed to get to at the same time. In places where these mass movements were most visible appeared the first public transportation routes. Initially these were horse-drawn omnibuses, but soon they were replaced by electric trams. And in 1863 in London was launched the world's first subway. In just a few decades many cities have developed such extensive tram systems that their size is still impressive. For example, in Strasbourg in the 1930s there were over 200 kilometers of tram tracks and trams moved 55 million passengers annually. But everything was changing. More and more space on the city streets was gained by the cars and later the architect Le Corbusier unveiled his plan Voisin, a concept for transforming the center of Paris into a rapid city divided into neighborhoods separated by multi-lane highways. Le Corbusier considered public transportation to be a leftover from the past and believed that private cars were the bright future. The tram has no right to exist in the center of a modern city, wrote Le Corbusier about his plan. By the way, the sponsor of the plan was Gabriel Voisin, a friend of the architect and, surprise surprise, the owner of car factory named after himself. So the plan was modestly named in his honor. Such a shy automotive lobby. Le Corbusier's ideas quickly gained popularity and hundreds of cities around the world began to implement them. Demolishing old neighborhoods, dismantling tram tracks and building skyscrapers, wide highways, multi-level intersections and underground crossings instead. The tone was set by the United States, but Europe was moving in the same direction. But the car-centric reality was not as happy as Le Corbusier had promised. The more cities built highways and multi-level intersections, the more car citizens bought and the longer traffic jams became. Cars were increasingly filling streets and squares, pushing out any other activity and demanding more. This was combined with an increase in noise, pollution and the number of accidents. City streets were becoming increasingly dangerous and uncomfortable. The main downside of private cars is that they are extremely inefficient in using urban space and are far behind public transport in this regard. For example, a Bombardier Flex City tram like this one from Berlin can carry 64 seated passengers. If the same number of people travel by cars, their line at a traffic light will stretch for more than 100 meters if there are four persons in each car. But this will never happen because in real life each car has an average of one and a half persons, so in reality this line will be at least twice longer. And if we take into account the passengers who can ride in the tram standing up, the difference will be even more striking. By the way, according to the 2017 European Urban Mobility Report, traffic jams in the European Union cost about 130 billion euros annually or just over 1% of European GDP. The same situation is with energy use. Public transportation is much more efficient in this regard and uses far less energy 
energy per passenger than a private car. Let's make a chart and compare the bigger numbers. Let's assume that 100,000 people in our city travel 5 kilometers every day. Using the tram, the total energy consumption per day will be 25,000 kilowatts, while driving small cars it will be 195,000. At the same time, driving large SUVs, they will have to burn as much as 440,000 kilowatts. 440 is much more than 25, and this is just for one day. Couple this with engine noise, exhaust and dust from tire abrasion, and the scale of the problem becomes clear. However, you probably see this problem every day from your window. So, considering that urban space and energy are limited, cities have to look for more efficient mobility modes and these are clearly not the private cars. On top of that, public transportation is also useful for reducing greenhouse gas emissions as it also produces fewer emissions per passenger. As of 2018, the most CO2 per capita in the world was generated in the United States, Canada and the Saudi Arabia, which are highly car -reactive countries. At the same time, in countries with more developed public transportation such as Germany, France and Spain, this number is almost three times lower. Meanwhile, the European Union is working to further reduce emissions. In January 2020, the European Parliament approved the European Green Deal, which is a set of policy initiatives aimed at making the European continent climate neutral by 2050, which has become a commitment for all EU members. Of course, developing a high-quality public transport is a complex task that takes hundreds of millions or even billions of euros and years of hard and consistent work. For example, the French city of Grenoble in 2017 spent 917 million euros on its public transportation system, which serves 600,000 agglomerations. Of course, it is complicated, time-consuming and expensive. But if we ignore the development of public transport, we'll have to deal with a whole bunch of unpleasant trends. People start buying even more cars and driving them constantly and everywhere. The streets become more polluted and noisy, which leads to a worsening quality of life, increased morbidity and mortality. And of course, people will spend more time in traffic jams, which means both economic losses and simple life discomfort. To do it right, we have to understand that public Transport is not a typical business, but rather a tool for healthy functioning of the city. It helps to reduce traffic jams, improve urban environment and make streets safer and more comfortable. That's why cities have to invest a lot of money in it. And it's profitable, because where there is good public transportation, business develops better, there is more demand for a property, there is no need to build a multi-lane highways and people have more time and money for their own needs and desires, which all means taxes and economic development. That's why we need to buy all these new modern trains, trams, trolleybuses and buses, create dedicated lanes for them, build modern depots and do many other things that should be discussed in separate videos.